This is the fifth and probably the last talk in a series on relationship. Um, inquiring into the, directly into the application of some of the teachings um, uh, for our human relationships. And I say it's uh, probably the last talk. Actually, every talk really is a talk about relationship. So um, we could go on and on forever and ever. Um, those of you who've been uh, part of the, the whole series that have extended now over quite a few months, remember that at the very beginning we spoke about the uh, truth of uh, dukkha in human life. And indeed, at times, we can notice the absence of dukkha, this sort of spacious awareness of uh, things that are pleasant, things that are unpleasant, but really held in a quality of kind and compassionate awareness so that it's not the, uh, the, the quality of pleasant or unpleasant isn't really what determines our happiness. Um, and that's such a key uh, teaching of the Buddhist teachings, that pain in this human life is inevitable, but suffering isn't. Uh, that this human life, these human relationships can be known in all of their glory, pleasant, unpleasant, uh, without the uh, loss of the pleasant, the changing, the, the ending of the pleasant, uh, or the arising of the unpleasant, really leading to suffering. And basically that's our practice. That's our practice through all of the teachings. Is that really true? And if so, how is it true? And how is it true in my human life and my human experience? So we've talked a bit about suffering relational suffering. And by the way, by relationships, I don't mean um, intimate relationships necessarily. Um, it can be any kind of relationship, um, including the relationships that we have with all of those political commentators on TV or all the politicians or the talk show hosts or the people who interrupt our dinner asking for donations. Um, that all of those uh, are human relationships. How do we be with all of those uh, 10,000 joys and 10,000 sorrows um, without suffering? It's really our practice. Um, relationship as the lay person's monastery. And we all know those experiences in our relationships of thinking, wow, this is really difficult. <laughs> You know, bringing relationships into our spiritual practice can be really quite a challenge. Um, I wanted to um, start with uh, just reminding you about the Metta Sutta, the Sutta on loving kindness. And it reads, um, it starts out, this is what is done by one who is skilled in goodness and who knows the path of peace. And it's a long sutta that really chronicles, this is what's done. And one of the passages really reads, um, just as a mother protects with her life, her child, her only child, so too, um, with a boundless heart, should one cherish all living beings. So too, with a boundless heart, should one cherish all living beings. So I would invite you to, as we um, talk together, um, or as I speak, probably um, there may or may not be time for questions, um, to bring into your awareness someone uh, with whom it's a bit of a challenge to have a boundless heart. And again, it might, it might be... Um, one of those radio talk commentators that, you know, you hear that name or you see that political person on TV and your heart really isn't so boundless. Or it might be someone very close to you. 
and your family living under the same roof or with whom you grew up. Because our, the teaching really is, so with a boundless heart, this is what's done by one who knows the path of peace, with a boundless heart, cherishing all living beings. This is the path of peace, the path of happiness. I wanted to tell a couple stories. Um, one of them, I read in the newspaper a story about a Muslim woman in, I forget which country, it was some Middle Eastern country, who had had an arranged marriage that turned out to be quite abusive, and she murdered her husband. And it said that in the um, uh, tradition of the tribe in which she lived, there were three options available to her family because it was seen as an affront um, to, her, to her own family of origin. And there were three options available to them. Um, one is that the uh, offended family, the, the husband's family, could then murder somebody in um, the wife's family in retaliation, at which point then someone in the wife's family would murder somebody in the husband's family. It would, you know, and that, that sometimes those kinds of things go on for generations. Um, so that was one option. The second option was that the wife's family could, in effect, pay the husband's family, um, either with actual money or goats or whatever, or with one of their daughters. They could offer one of their daughters in marriage to this other clan. And that was the second option. And the third option was that the wife's family could kill her. Um, and that basically in the traditions of this, um, this tribe, those were essentially the three, the three options that were available to them. And um, I just invite you to kind of look at the mind that's arising and to just look and see what kinds of thoughts, what kinds of reactivity might be arising from that story. Because it's kind of easy for us to kind of, you know, click our tongues and tisk tisk and say, well, you know, that is just so incredibly backward. You know, we would never do anything like that. Um, and I will propose to you that that is just sort of at a, at a grosser level and at a kind of more communal level, something that we all experience every day um, in terms of how do we respond when there is um, an, an assault of some sort, when there's something that's difficult, when there's something that's painful? Um, I'm going to tell you a personal story in a minute. But before I do, just consider, for example, um, the, react the reaction at 9-11, you know, when we had this terrible assault, and just how challenging, you know, so with a boundless heart should one cherish all living beings that it was very challenging for us to inquire, you know, surely the Buddha didn't mean this, you know, or sure, you know, it's like, how do we do this? How do we do this, even with great pain? How do we, you know, and there really aren't any exceptions in, this, in the teachings or in the medicine. He doesn't say, you know, with a boundless heart unless somebody's really mean to you. Um, um, in fact, some of the suttas are really quite explicit with some pretty detailed summaries of even if, you know, even if someone were to fly into your buildings and kill thousands of people, even then have a boundless heart. So it really gives us quite a tall order when we think about these family relationships or these interpersonal relationships that we encounter every day. As I was preparing the talk, I thought of a, an example that happened to me not too long ago, and I thought I would tell you, because we can actually track it in much the same way as my story about the Muslim family. It's just a different scale. It's just a different scale. Um, um, and so my story is, um, I have a friend who um, has been doing um, some writing, and he asked me to look at something he had written uh, about loving kindness and um, tell him what I thought, you know, give him some feedback. 
And I did, and um, really thought, in general, I thought it was really quite lovely. But I said, you know, this one section here, I'm not very fond of this one, thinking, you know, that I was sort of being helpful. That that, you know. And it turned out that actually that wasn't quite what he wanted, and he got quite reactive um, to my response. He got quite agitated. He told me that he didn't know what my problem was, that everyone else who had read it really liked that section in particular, um, and so that you know there was something really kind of wrong with, with um, my perception, and um, that really if I read it again it would be different. And then he kind of went on to tell me that um, furthermore, um, he had noticed about me that I was rather rigid and narrow-minded, and, um, and he really hoped one day to understand why that was such a character trait of mine. Well, clearly, clearly um, I had touched a nerve uh, that, the, you know, that there was some real reactivity. But what is interesting, so it's sort of like, okay, so I'm kind of getting assaulted. But what was interesting was to watch my own response to it, my own, just my own internal response. Um, and I, and I, I wrote it down because I had quite a... Um, quite a, a list um, of really, um, really the experience, if you will, of dukkha. You know, ouch. Because to kind of be confronted with that reactivity in a way that, that really, you know, there wasn't much of anything to do about it because he wasn't really available at that moment for, for any kind of narrative about it. But to really kind of experience that kind of interpersonal reactivity, that interpersonal pain, is something that we all do huh? every day. We, we have these moments where we just sort of bump into something that's quite challenging. Um, Victor Bird uh, says, Who among us has not suffered from the ache of desperately some, wanting something um, that we can never have? In this case, really wanting him to understand me, you know, wanting him, you know, it's like that isn't what I meant and I'm so sorry if I hurt your feelings or whatever, but, you know, just this sort of wanting there to be peace right then when peace just wasn't available. Um, and Huston Smith says, it is a desire for self at the expense, if necessary, of all other forms of life. And what he means by that is that hunger for the pleasant, you know, or to solve some, that problem, like right now. So I want to get rid of this unpleasant experience right now, even if, even if it means, okay, he murdered somebody in my family, now I'll murder somebody back. You know, can I get rid of the unpleasant experience regardless regardless of what the collateral damage might be. And so I was watching um, my own response. And um, first, you know, so sort of like bing, 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 in terms of what's arising in my own mind, you know, I wanted to argue back. I wanted to explain and say, you know, you know but I'm right because blah, 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 blah. And, but the thing was, there really wasn't any room at the moment, and we all know these places, we've all been in these places, right? Um, <laughs> many times a day sometimes. But where, where, you know, we're just really not open to any kind of, especially any kind of argument. So I could, I watched myself sort of want to go, but, 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 you know, to, to really argue back. That kind of, okay, you murdered me, and now, you know, you murdered, you know, and this kind of back and forth, which actually would just lead to more back and forthness, more back and forthness. Um, I wanted to point out to his, I wanted to then get very psychological about it and point out his reactivity. It's like, you know, you really are pretty upset about that. Um, and don't you think maybe there's something that here that's, that, you know, doesn't have to do with me, you know, it's like to kind of get a little superior and, and point out his reactivity. Then I, th then I saw that and I thought, well, that's not so skillful. And then I decided, well, well, I'll just withdraw, you know. He's being a jerk, you know. I'll, I'll just withdraw. 
And then I could watch it. You know, it's like, I want to get away so I can think about this. And you know how the thinking goes, don't you? <laughs> you know, where we kind of obsess about, you know, what happened and who did what and why I'm right and he's wrong and furthermore what I should have said. And, you know, where the mind just kind of moves into that sort of reactivity of, of, um, of uh, um, thinking, 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 ruminating, ruminating, but from a distance. You know, okay, it's like, okay, fine, I'm not going to go to war with you like right here, but I'll go to war with you in my own mind, you know, where we do that. Um, I watched and then I thought, well, that's not so wholesome either. And then I thought, well, I'll just withdraw and, and pout. <laughs> you know, I'll sulk, you know, poor me. Um, and I just won't engage with him. We were at a social gathering. I just won't engage with him. Um, I'll do that. Um, then I watched my mind, you know, kind of begin to characterize him in much the same way. You know? You know how we do that? You know, the reason he's doing that is, and furthermore, he's always like that. I'll have to remember this in the future because, you know, in the future he's going to be like this again. Um, and I know that because I had this one experience with him. And then, of course, there's always the option of gossiping about him at some future date. You know? <laughs> I wondered if I was doing that tonight. <laughs> but I decided that, I, that my motive was really a bit clearer than that, which was to, you know, it's not so different, is it, from the Muslim family? You know, it's just a difference in scale. And it's coming out of the individual rather than the group or the tribe or the family. But it's really not so different. You know, if someone hurts me, our human tendency, really, is to, is to try to get rid of it, you know. We were talking at one, in one of the talks, we talked about tanha or hunger, the hunger for, um, for pleasure, the hunger to be acknowledged and seen, the hunger to be safe. And we're talking hunger here. This human tendency, you know. I mean, even amoebas want things to be pleasant. You know, it's just part of our biology. And this hunger that's fed by clinging, by hanging on. We talked last time about clinging, where we cling to what's pleasant. We hang on. You know, think of things that, are, that, are, that cling. You know, I was trying to think, well, what clings? You know, like cling wrap. You know how it kind of gone? You know, and so we cling. We want things to be pleasant. We can't let go. Um, or, you know, something like, you know, in the movie, theater where you, get, you walk in and it's like you stick to the floor, <laughs> you know, where we stick to these thoughts that we have about self and other, and we can't, you know, we can't let them go, you know, we're like hanging on to them, and they feed these hungers, so if I kind of go back and I ruminate about him and I cling and I think about it, and, you know, it's like, you know, reason why I'm right and he's wrong and it just and and there's this just feeding the hunger, feeding the hunger, and really feeding the suffering. It's not much different from that Middle Eastern community. It's really not much different. And we all know these places where we get caught in these relational hungers, this suffering, this these places where things are difficult. And we, we really, we, we don't even remember that there is such a thing as a boundless heart, much less how to cultivate it. Yeah. Um, so that our practice really invites us to, first of all, know the suffering. You know, to know the ouch. Ow, that was really unpleasant. That was really difficult. And to know the ouch of, you know, at this moment, there isn't anything I can do about it. Just at this moment, there, you know, there, there, wasn't, there wasn't anything to say. You know, I tried a couple things, but there really, you know, for whatever reasons, uh, he was quite agitated. And there really wasn't anything at that moment to do about it. It doesn't say anything about any future moments, but at that moment, there wasn't anything to do about it. And so there's this sort of icky kind of feeling of just, oh, that was unpleasant, and I can't fix it. I just can't fix it. So how do we work with that? 
You know, and so the Buddha invites us. He kind of, you know, he, he talks the first noble truth. There is suffering. It's not your fault. You know, it's part of this human path. There is suffering. It just happens. Um, second noble truth, the cause of suffering is this hunger, this tanha, this, this um, hunger for the pleasant, this um, kind of uh, genetically ingrained hunger and the clinging that feeds it. The good news is in the third noble truth, he said, you know, we can release this hunger. We can release this, this clinging, you know. And um, many of the suttas uh, talk about um, cessation of clinging. I actually, <laughs> I get a little reactive when I hear the word cessation um, because uh, for me, it's like, you know, cessation sort of in, in invites me to think, you know, well, you just stop, you know. You just don't do that or something like that or now you're liberated and everything's fine. And for me, it doesn't work quite that simply, quite that way, although I do believe that it's possible. Um, I, I prefer to think in terms of um, words like abandoning or fading, the fading of the hungers, the fading of the need for pleasure, the insistence that life be pleasant, the fading of the insistence that I be understood or that my ideas uh, prevail. Um, and so how did that work in this case? Well. It, how it worked um, for me is to go through each of those and to say, okay, there, is this going to lead to the end of suffering? If I fight back, if I argue with him, is this going to cause more suffering or is this going to lead to the end of suffering? Well, it's not likely to lead to the end of suffering. So can I let go of the need to argue? talk about abandoning or fading. Can I let go of the need to argue? And can I allow this moment of misunderstanding? Um, let me point to his errors. Let me point out how reactive he is. Is that actually likely in this moment to lead to um, the ending of suffering or the increase of suffering? Uh, well, mm, it's not likely to lead to the ending of suffering. Can I release the insistence that I have to show him how reactive he is? Can I work internally with my own mind and just let go? You know, kind of separate that cling wrap. <laughs> let go. Let me withdraw and obsess in my own mind about the unfairness of it all. Well, I might need to withdraw to calm down, but I watch the tendency to withdraw as punishment. You know, and to withdraw, you know, so that I could just kind of feed more twigs internally to my fire. Can I let go of both? Can I just let go of the thinking about it? that is not wholesome? Can I stay engaged in whatever form? This was again, it was a fairly large social gathering. Can I stay engaged in whatever form is available to me, is, is realistically available, so, you know, so I'm not like faking something? Which again requires this letting go. Um, similarly with withdrawing and sulking and pouting, I've been injured. Can I know that injury is part of this human life? It's part of the deal of being born on this planet. It's not, you know, like there's some grave mistake and someplace someone or someone someplace else really has a life where there's no injury, where there's no suffering, there's no pain. Can I accept this as simply part of this human experience? Um, let me build in my own mind a characterization of him. Can I stop it? Can I know that this is a temporary moment? That 
is arising, I have no idea why, and I can't understand it. I may never understand it. And it's a temporary moment. It is not who he is. It is not who I am. Can I let go of those ideas and just keep coming back to the present moment? To bring it out in gossip with another person at some future date. We all know that temptation. Can I have a commitment to abandoning that when it arises over and over and over and over again? So this quality of boundless heart really is something that we can touch into and we do touch into at times just through grace. where we see something incredibly painful or incredibly difficult and we have a quality of grace. Sometimes when someone dies, um, that we just know just all of the goofiness in their lives, but it's somehow all okay. Um, And there's a moment of grace. But sometimes it really requires a really diligent, energetic effort to let go of what is unwholesome. over and over again. And that's where the fading comes in as well. Because when we do that, over time, the energy of it really does soften, does release, um, so that it doesn't come up so strongly over and over again. And when one is enlightened, I think the energy doesn't come up at all, that the boundless heart just simply is there and pervades, and so that there really isn't any, any seed, if you will, to sprout. Um, but we can cultivate, we can practice not germinating those seeds. There also are practices that we can do um, which have to do with um, taking more, more active practices in a positive direction. Let's say there's someone very difficult in our family and, um, you know, we, for whatever reasons, uh, need to uh, interact with them and this sort of thing happens with some regularity, we can actually cultivate a, a boundless heart in, um, in active ways through cultivating qualities of loving kindness and compassion or cultivating, um, actually taking refuge, um, taking refuge in people who are wise um, or helpful. Um, there were times when um, early in my relationships with my family, Sometimes when I would go back to family gatherings and my husband and I would literally plan ahead of time how we could be wholesome together, how we could help each other. Just, you know, anticipating the kinds of places where, you know, we get touched or triggered. You know. So can we practice, you know, so can I take refuge in sangha in that case? Can I take refuge in community and people who help? So the Buddha teaches us that it's the mind that creates suffering. It's not the external world. The external world can offer pain, but it's the mind that creates suffering, and the work of healing that really is in our minds. I wanted to touch on a couple of the questions. Um, When I first did this, um, I asked people to submit questions, and... um, um, so I wanted to really touch on a couple of the questions. Um, and uh, many of the questions really are so touching. I read them every time I do a talk. And they're so touching because there's such wisdom in the intention. You know, people start out the question that says, how can I? <laughs> you know, how can I be more compassionate? How can I have more openness? And that wisdom of intention is an incredibly wholesome starting place, especially when we have these kind of chronic relationships that are so difficult, you know, to really keep inviting, how can I, how is, how is this possible, really as a real question, because the Buddha says happiness, freedom from suffering, complete, complete freedom from suffering is possible. It is really why we practice. Why else would we, would we be doing these things? You know? 
So then we ask the question, well, okay, in this situation, how, you know, how do I do this? And just asking the question is like with those Muslim families, you know, to ask, isn't there a fourth option here? You know, isn't there another way of being with us? And the Buddha says, of course, yes. I think the Quran probably does someplace too. Um, and here's one of the questions. I wonder about how to have clear speech in moments of dukkha. <laughs> I wrote my answer on this one. Yes. <laughs> yeah. You know. What is clear speech here? Sometimes clear speech might be saying something like, please, please get off my foot. You know, my, you're stepping on my toe. Um, or can we talk about this later? I mean, so that clear speech can, can be wholesome, but clear speech and wholesome speech comes out of that boundless heart. It doesn't come out as a, as a like, a whack. You know? So, indeed, how can I, you know, how, how do I have clear speech? In, in this case that I'm telling you about in my experience, clear speech at that moment was literally to bow and be silent. That was clear speech. In that case, it isn't always clear speech. Sometimes clear speech requires real speaking. Um, I have an extremely difficult relationship, family relationship, I think it is. Currently, I'm trying to be compassionate towards her in my meditation as well as offering forgiveness. Good. Good. Who knows the reasons why someone... I mean, in this case with me, who knows the reasons why someone, you know, is reactive or, uh, you know, causes suffering? Hatred never ceases by hatred, the, the uh, Buddha says. Can we practice that? Can we practice that on the phone with that telemarketer who inter interrupts our dinner? Hmm? Can we practice that? Can we practice that with your children who didn't pick up their toys for the 400th time or, you know, the laundry that didn't get folded. Can we practice that? Is it okay to sever a family relationship? I might ask if it's possible ever, if it's possible ever to sever any relationship since we're also interconnected. You know, we're interconnected with the butterflies in Argentina. Um, you know, we can't sever our connection but we can practice a wholesome relationship, a wholesome quality of that relationship, which might mean um, creating a bit of distance. But again, the question there is, can we offer distance with a boundless heart? Uh, or is the distance a way of you know, punishing? So it might be wholesome to get a bit of distance. It might be overwhelming to spend too much time with someone who's very toxic and difficult. Um, might be a good idea to turn off that radio talk show that is just annoying you so much. Yeah. And then the inquiry might be, well, what kind of heart do you do that with? What's going on in your heart? Because the Metta Sutta really isn't talking about somehow you know, wandering through the world, dropping flowers on everybody. Um, the Metta Sutta really is teaching us how to have a boundless heart, how to release the suffering in our own hearts. And through that, we release the suffering in the world. Um, someone asked about releasing over and over again judgmental attitudes which separate. And again, that's different from releasing discernment. We're not, we're not asking ourselves to release discernment. You know, I was able to discern that this person was acting in, a, in an unwholesome way. It wasn't so skillful. I had no idea why, and there was nothing I could do about it. But I didn't have to pretend that somehow he was, he was, he was being skillful. Um, and the other thing is we can release any criticism of ourselves when we're hurting. I caused it somehow. I think that was one of the earlier questions. You know, that somehow, if something bad happens, I caused it. How can one release a past relationship and its connections? So there's, here she's not talking about severing, but releasing. 
a past relationship that's over, we've moved on, that kind of place where we ruminate about all the things that the other person did wrong. Um, and how we do that is we practice. So that when we find ourselves ruminating there, we, we know that it's time to stop ruminating, to let go, you know, that cling wrap. And sometimes it can be really quite hard. Okay. But we know that it's simply not wholesome to continue to feed poison. What is it, Alice in Wonderland, as she goes through and she sees the little bottle of poison and, she's, and she goes, hmm, she says, I suppose if you drink a little poison every day, it's bound to affect you sooner or later. You know, this the sense of, you know, we feed our brains, we feed our minds poison. And can we stop doing that? Um, what is right action regarding our assumptions concerning the motives of someone who is challenging us or unskillful? Right action regarding our assumptions, our views, our ideas. Um, and here I would propose that the challenge is to allow the difficulty of not knowing. We don't have any idea what the causes and conditions are that cause someone else to behave unskillfully. Um, we only have um, control over how we behave and how we respond and whether or not we contribute in that murderous way, you know, okay, murder, 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 murder. And even that, those subtle ways where we murder people in our minds. Right? Or we murder them with gossip, or we murder them with these little words here and there. Or we murder them by just withdrawing from the relationship in a way that's hurtful and harmful. So we kind of read these things in the newspaper and we think, well, this just is sort of obvious, guys. Don't do it like that. But then when it comes to our own hearts and our own experience, we see that it's really quite a challenge. So the Buddha invites us to practice. He invites us to, um, to see that you know, hatred really doesn't end with hatred. Um, Let none deceive another or despise any being in any state. Let none through anger or ill will wish harm upon another. Even as a mother protects with her life, her child, her only child, so with a boundless heart should one cherish all living beings. So may we cultivate over and 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 over again, a boundless heart toward all beings, including ourselves, as we work with this path in every aspect of our lives. So thank you. Oh,